So now I want to introduce our morning keynote, Stuart McClure. So Stuart is the president and CEO of Silence Inc. He is one of the industry's leading authorities in, infor in information security today. Stuart is the creator and lead author of the most successful security book of all time, Hacking Exposed. It's now on version seven. I have two versions myself, and it, it's very good. Uh, Stuart now leads Silence as its CEO and visionary for a new approach to threat detection and response. Prior to Silence, Stuart was the global CTO and general manager of the security management business unit for McAfee Intel. In 1999, he launched Foundstone Inc., which was acquired by McAfee in 2004. Please join me in welcoming Stuart McClure. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stuart McClure, Chief Executive Officer, President, Silence Incorporated. I always get really scared when my head's that big, so let, me, let my nerves settle out here. Good morning, everybody. Well, thanks so much for having me. I have the uh, dubious honor of talking to you early in the morning and talking to you about math. So for those of you like me that uh, mathematics uh, weren't, weren't your A pluses across the board, um, I'm hoping to make it a, a little simpler because I do believe it is probably the best hope we have inside of security to change the way that we detect and prevent uh, the most malicious of attacks. So let's get right to it. For those of you uh, philosophers in the room, um, my degree was computer science, philosophy, and psychology, kind of a crazy, crazy mix. Uh, I was just bored to tears with each one, um, had to combine them all. But one of the cool things, one of my favorites was Plato, and he often was quoted as saying, we can easily forgive a child who's afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light, and what constantly comes back to me conceptually is this idea of the allegory of the cave. Now, if you're not super familiar with this concept, it's real simple. Basically, as Plato puts it, the scene, you have prisoners bound and shackled that can only see silhouettes or shadows inside of a cave. And what they see is what other people are projecting up onto the wall of the cave. Well, this is all they see for their entire life. So of course, to them, that is their reality, and that is the sum total of the reality. And what ends up happening, one of the prisoners escapes and is able to get out into the real world and experience the sun on their body, uh, smell the fresh air, and coming back into the cave, trying to explain what he's seen, um, he was, of course, rejected. Um, out of hand because they couldn't understand that concept. The modern day equivalent of this, or at least past 10 or 14 years, is the matrix, right? The red pill versus the blue pill decision. And this is one of the biggest challenges I think we have as an industry. We have built an entire security mindset based on a reactive paradigm. And what I mean by reactive is we have to see an attack and identify it via human eyeballs before we know it's an attack and can build in a way of detecting it on everyone else. It's what's often considered the sacrificial lamb problem um, or the patient zero. There has to be a first victim. We have to be able to look at that victim, how they've been victimized, and then we have to figure out a way to programmatically build into products or into services, managed services like Andy was talking about a way of detecting it going forward with all the new customers and the new victims. And that is, by and large, I believe, our biggest problem. And what that's created is this iceberg effect, where you have, uh, you've seen all the statistics. I'm not going to uh, beat you to death with it. But what's happened is what we see is really just a small percentage of what is actually happening out there. And the proof, really, is when you get to a place where you're detecting 95, 99% of all the attacks out there. And until you get to that space, it's hard to actually see below the waterline. And it's that unknown unknowns that where math and really statistical analysis is coming into play. So let's talk about that. 
So what's happened because of all of this is by and large, people have thrown in the, the white flag and the towel. They've said, look, I, I give up on trying to prevent this stuff. I can't, it comes in too fast, new techniques, new uh, forms of it, new shapes of it, I just give up. What I'm gonna move to is a respond scenario, right? I'm sure plenty of you have felt that, where we're just gonna get the best slop bucket around, right, the fastest team to go clean up, we're gonna detect the problem, we're gonna clean up faster than anyone else. So it's the mean time to remediate, right? And that's how we're gonna measure ourselves. The problem is, you don't have to do that. But our industry has almost forced us because it has been so ineffective. And what we've got is basically this, if you don't recognize. Uh, this is, um, of course, pig with wig, and you could put lipstick on this thing all day long, and it's just gonna be as ugly as it always has been. It's, you're never going to actually improve. So, how do we do this? Um, I often get in trouble with this concept, and uh, so don't feel bad if, if it stirs a little bit in you. But I've often joked, half so, half serious, that about, there's been about 10 original ideas in the history of mankind. And I actually brought this topic up so stupidly at a, uh, Thanksgiving, a family Thanksgiving dinner once <laughs> uh, of my girlfriends at the time, well, a long, long time ago, and boy, I was not a, a fan uh, at the table because everybody believes that their ideas are so original and unique, and how dare I say that there were like 10 original ideas that just been built on top of each other. But if we look out in the world and we look at some of the spaces that have applied math and statistics, what we realize is that it's been applied in a lot of different industries, from the insurance industry, the trading industry, the uh, genome sequencing, drug pharmaceutical industry, even to the high tech industry. It is everywhere, okay, math and science to determine the best searching algorithms for what Netflix you wanna go into, uh, to recognizing your voice and your commands via that voice recognition, to drone piloting and flight stabilization, you name it. So why haven't we really applied this model to the world of security? So if we do, if we did and said, okay, look, let's take a lot of what the world has given us around formulaic approaches to this problem, whether it be you know, simple Pythagoras or Euclidean uh, rule sets, and we said, okay, we've now built a science and a math around the world as we know it, why, why not apply it into the world of security? And when you do, what you end up getting is an amazingly powerful technology that allows you to not just detect what's already out there today, but to detect what will be out there tomorrow without any changes to it. So let me give you a quick scenario. We do this every day, by the way, just so you know, all unconsciously. So this is Bob. My uh, daughter, my youngest daughter, Jillian, loves to call everybody Bob. So that's, uh, that's Bob. And let's say you know Bob. And Bob comes in and, and says, hey, how's it going today? Holds out his hand, shakes hand. You say, great, uh, good to see you, Bob. Tomorrow, he comes in, he looks like this, right? He's a mess. Now, we don't know really what's wrong with Bob. It could be just severe allergies, or it could be a bigger problem. He could have Ebola, for crying out loud, right? Well, I guess we kicked that now, but uh, you get the gist. And he, sh he holds out his hand. Now, what do you do in that moment? You might give a split millisecond pause, right? How well do I know Bob? Am I gonna insult him if I don't hold, you know, shake his hand? He's showing signs of badness, but we don't know really what it is. He's sweating, he's bloodshot eyes, runny nose, coughing. We don't know if it's something really bad or if it's just simple allergies. Well, what if we could? What if we could actually know, and we do this subtly and unconsciously within our own brains through our, what I call our experiential database that we collect over the years and decades. What if we could take Bob and actually boil him down to his very DNA? Just run with me on this. And if we could, before that, map all of the healthy DNA and we could map all of the unhealthy DNA, 
go down to Atlanta, run through the CDC, actually catalog, collect, document, and actually mathematically prove out that DNA. What if we could then, when we saw Bob the next day, actually simply query his DNA and say, he's most likely sick, and he's most likely sick by some form of virus or bacteria. It's not just an immune system reaction. Well, this is in large part what the Human Genome Project has done over the years, and it's what we are starting to find in security being very effective at applying to detection of threats, the most simple to the most advanced. So this is how we do it. The first model, the first part of it, the first phase of any of, of this approach is you have to collect as large amount of data as possible. In Bob's case, you have to collect as many healthy DNA samples as humanly possible. In the security world, it's files, it's executables. It's anything that would be a potential executable element for compromise onto the endpoint. So we collect over eight terabytes of data, both known good, known bad. We vet all of that data. And that would include all the files you see here and many more. Then we extract as many features of that, those files as humanly possible. We are now over five million features. So five million features. If you think about the features we were looking at, Bob, it was what, the sweaty, uh, bloodshot eyes, runny nose, right? Those were just three, five, 10, maybe 20 features unconsciously that you look for in, in detecting if somebody's sick and whether or not to shake their hand. So we detect and, and we map about five million now. Third is we transform all of that data, the feature extraction, we vectorize it Okay, uh, and we train our machine learning models for what is good and what is bad. And because you, can ha you have so many files with so many features, you have an amazingly accurate way of determining what is truly bad and what is truly good. At this point, you can classify whether or not this new file is either well, trained as good or trained as bad. And you can also cluster. So you can tell when a new file or sample comes in, what is it most similar to? Is it most similar to a Microsoft DLL or is it most similar to Poison Ivy? And it's that mathematical similarity and clustering that is incredibly powerful to give you context around that particular file on the endpoint. And all of that is, by and large, automated and done in real time. So the next time you have Bob come in with the symptoms, and you're applying it now to our world of security and files, that extraction technique is probably one of the most important aspects of what you do in machine learning. It's taking as many characteristics and features of each set and mapping them definitively to the target. So as I mentioned before, we have over five million features. And what is a feature? I often get that request. I get two real questions. One is, what are the features that you look for? And the second is, what's the math? So I'm going to walk you through that real quick. The features are everything that you could pull statically from that particular file or element, either in memory or from disk into memory. And it's incredibly powerful because it is a simple processor exercise. There is nothing complex. There's no heavy lifting for this. Simple, you know, i3s can, can handle it great. So extracting as many features as humanly possible, we map to a total space of over 5 million, but on the endpoint, it's 2.8 million. We can also extract the disassembled code and map that as a feature as well. And that's in large part also how we were able to get to such large numbers in our feature set. So once the features are extracted, we then transform, of course, and we'll vectorize it, right? And we start to train our model. So this is how we do it. It's real simple. You have X number of files. You have X, Y number of features. And you're able to then determine which file has which feature. You train on good. You train on bad. 
and you get a very, very large vectorized number that can then be used to determine when a new sample comes in to your system and tries to execute, like let's say you click on a link, right? That's a water holing attack. Or you open, not you of course, none of us, but your users click on an attachment in an email that slipped through all the filters. Well, we can then determine whether or not it matches statistically to the good or it matches statistically to the bad. And when it matches somewhere in the middle, we can call that out too. And we can do further analysis in an automated way to determine if it's truly good or bad and then move it into one of those arenas. And this is all done all automatically. So that vectorization process is really quite simple. It's complex in, in terms of its size, but it's simple in terms of concept. You basically boil down all those features into a mathematical number, a matrix of, of a number that can then be fed into our machine learning. Now, so this is what you get. This is a visual of a large sample set with three features. That's it, three features, right? And it's things like file size and a certain import that we looked for and one other. Now this is simply three features. Imagine now, of course, machine learning handling five million features. It's a, effectively a uh, five million uh, end graph, which is in, impossible for us in our brains to actually much, conceive, much less actually prove. So that's why the machines come in handy to tell us this. So everything to the left of the hyperplane is bad. Everything to the right is good based on our training set. So when a new sample comes in, it can easily map to the left of the hyperplane as bad or the right, which is good. And we can determine that in a matter of milliseconds with the technology today. And this is what makes it so powerful because we don't have to see what comes out tomorrow to react today. We can react right now. So that's why we can be so effective detecting zero days, advanced threats, APTs, you name it. And uh, honestly, this, the science and, and the math and statistics behind this has just now become available to the industry and I predict a large number of companies taking this concept and blowing it up into their own respective uh, products and feature sets. So the other concept I want to um, make sure I, I communicate here is that hyperplane, the real question is how do you find that hyperplane, which is that line, right, between the good and the bad? And it's, it's the second most uh, frequented question of me behind fe what features you extract. And really, there have been a number of agencies, government agencies, for example, and some companies that have tried this and failed. And while I don't know the specifics of every single project that's been attempted and failed, I, I can tell you what I have discovered is that most people don't collect enough features. They usually rely on 100 features or 300 features or something very, very small. So you end up getting a lot of false positives. The data set is not large enough. Or the algorithms themselves, they rely on just one algorithm. This is something called gradient descent. So if you were looking at a topographical uh, world, let's say just of a map, and you wanted a machine to determine the lowest point inside that topographical 3D map, you would use an algorithm called gradient descent. And it would take basically all the X, Y, Z coordinates, and it would allow you to determine where at the bottom of that is. That is effectively what the technology uh, within our machine learning system does. That's one of many. We have four different algorithms that we combine together in what's called an ensemble model. So uh, uh, applying all four plus algorithms gets incredible accuracy and predictive capability. So at the end of the day, what we are doing and what the industry is moving towards is this mathematical detection and prevention that can allow the endpoint itself without ever being connected to the cloud, it can be totally independent, autonomous, unplugged from the network and the internet, it can actually detect and prevent and control execution 
at that key decision making point to be able to allow it or block it or just alert uh, if it is bad. And that's at the heart of it because we really believe victimization occurs at the endpoint. It's, it's at the end node, uh, the laptops, the virtual desktops, wherever it is. The user, as Andy mentioned before, right? The user is the new perimeter, 100% agree. Because the user can click on anything, the user can open anything, the user can plug anything onto, into their, their asset. And what our industry has done is because we've been so reactive, we couldn't fix the core of the problem, which is that bad things execute. So what's happened is we've added layer upon layer upon layer of detection. So we'll have an email plugin or gateway. We'll have a web plugin or gateway. We'll have a firewall or we'll have a USB device control uh, component. We'll have a social engineering uh, whiz bang widget right, that detects whether or not your users are going out to Facebook and clicking on stuff or doing, doing malicious stuff. Um, even insider threats, right? But all of, these, all of these techniques require one thing to occur or you will not have victimization, and that is execution at the endpoint. And it's that execution at the endpoint is where we capture it, where we stop it, and where we analyze and look at what's trying to execute before we allow it to happen. And what that does is create an incredible, incredibly effective uh, platform for determining and preventing bad stuff. So as I mentioned before, I really believe in my heart, uh, I've been doing this for 27 plus years now, um, and I can tell you that there, in the world of security solutions, both services and products, I basically boil it down into these four categories. You have kind of reporting and auditing. You have control of privacy. You have denial of service. And you have control of execution. And for the most part, every technology, every service can be included into one of these four buckets. But at the end of the day, if you control execution, you remove the threat surface area so dramatically um, that you are now able to be truly predictive and preventative without the headache of a patient zero. And you can start to think about uh, the layers that you currently have in place. So I came from a, uh, a big uh, vendor, security vendor out there, and of course we had thousands and thousands of analysts, thousands of eyeballs on the problem. So we would get the email from a customer that got hit, despite our technology being on there. We would rally the troops. We would respond quickly. We'd figure out why they got hit. We would write a new signature, a new update, and we'd get it out there, and we, you know, we're very happy, right? But at the end of the day, you still had victims. You had one or 100 or 1,000 or whatever it was. And that's, that's just unacceptable. It's because we, we were reactive. We as an industry have been reactive. But what we have to do and think of it as is that we can actually do all of that far more effective with far few, far fewer eyeballs. And we can now apply that into our technology to allow for the automation of that process. So we've, we've asked you all throughout the, really the industry itself since it began, that you, you need to trust us, trust the vendor, trust us that we know what is good and what is bad. And I'm, for the first time, challenging you, the audience here, and the world to do one more thing. Don't trust the vendor. Trust the math. And it's our job and duty to help explain the math and how it works and how effective it is so that you can get there. Because we've certainly seen throughout history how math and science have been able to advance all of us and uh, our, our civilization and industries. So with that, I will just wrap up for a little bit more detail. Uh, Silence Math white paper, you can go to a blog and Twitter which we cover all of this every single day as we find new attacks with the technology. It's really kind of exciting. I I'm like a kid in a candy store. I wake up every morning, it's like Christmas morning, you can go into customer uh, portals and kind of take a look, okay, what did we catch today? What did we catch yesterday? And uh, it's been really, really powerful and very gratifying for me and humbling as well. Um, if you uh, like as well, you can test drive with, with my.silence.com. 
Okay, with that, unless there's a question or two, I will uh, thank you very much for attending. <laughs>